All right. Welcome, everyone. This is the Unit 4 hearing for the We the People National Invitational with Woodside Middle School. My name is Ryan Susky. I'm Director of Programs over at the Ohio Center for Law-Related Education, and I'll be the facilitator for today's hearing. <clears throat> Excuse me. In just a moment, I'm going to have the judges introduce themselves, followed by the students, uh, and then we will go ahead and start the hearing. The process for the hearing today is that students will deliver a four-minute prepared statement, followed by eight minutes of judge follow-up. <clears throat> I'm going to have my microphone muted during the hearing, uh, but I will be holding up the one minute and time signs. So I do recommend that you have your computer set on gallery view so that you can see my time cards and of course uh, your colleagues during the presentation. At the conclusion of the hearing, judge will give brief feedback to the teams and then we will conclude. With that, I'll go ahead and hand things over to your chairperson to begin the introductions. Okay, well, thank you, Ryan, and uh, it's good to see the uh, people from Woodside again today. Uh, I, we will follow through to uh, introduce ourselves to assure you that no one's uh, changed their names to check and make sure you haven't changed your names or your school uh, overnight, and then we will proceed to the question. My name is, again, still Joe Stewart, and I believe I'm still employed in the political science department at Clemson University in, in South Carolina. Hi, I'm Diana Owen. I'm a political science professor at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Nice to see you again. Hi, I'm Deshaun Whitaker, a We the People teacher in Charles County Public Schools in Maryland. And let's confirm your identities again. Hi, my name is Blake Adams. Hello again, I am Ruger Kincaid. Hello, I'm Ethan Abels. Hello, I'm Devin Forrester, and this is our teacher, Mr. Half. Good to see you again, Mr. Half, and all, all the team, too. Okay, no surprise, we are dealing with uh, question two today, so I'll read that question. Uh, if a law has been properly passed by, a lawmaking, uh, by the lawmaking branches of a democratic government, why should judges have the power to declare it unconstitutional? That's a quotation from uh, political scientist Robert Dahl. Do you agree or disagree with Robert Dahl? Why? What is judicial review and why is it controversial? What has been the impact of judicial review on American society? Once the Supreme Court has decided that the law is unconstitutional, what power, if any, do the people have to change the constitution? You may begin. Good morning. Our group disagrees with Aubrey Dow. Judicial review is very controversial and many people support its main ideas. The definition of judicial review in article three, section one states that the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. Some people contest this though. Many people say that it should be the, the people's rights to deem if it, if it laws unconstitutional. The Marbury v. Madison case was the court case many people say invented judicial review. The court case was brought to the courthouse when William Marbury sued James Madison because Madison wouldn't give Marbury's job back after unlawfully taking it away. The court decided that what Madison did was unconstitutional and judicial review was born. In conclusion, many people liked and disliked judicial review. But there's also one standing question. What was the impact of judicial review on American society? One of the major impacts of judicial review on American society would be the case uh, of, Homer, of Homer or of Plessy versus Ferguson, where in 1896, a man named Homer Plessy refused to sit in a black only car and he was promptly arrested. However, Homer uh, completed the Supreme Court on how the, it was how the law was unconstitutional, and the Supreme Court agreed that it did violate the 14th Amendment. Another example would be the case of Brown v. the Board of Education, where in 1954, Linda Brown, who lived only a few blocks away from a white-only school, had to walk 21 blocks to a black-only school. Linda's parents and other parents filed a lawsuit against the school and won because the court said it was unconstitutional. One last more modern example would be the case of FEC v. Citizens United, where in a law that was passed stated that you can support a candidate through a business similar to a middleman scenario. And, they, and Citizens United said that that law was unconstitutional. However, the court said the FEC had the right to freedom of speech. Our judges are as honest as other men and not more so. 
they have with others the same passion for party, for power, and privilege of their corpse. Thomas Jefferson. One of the most aggressive ways to change the Constitution is to leave, to form your own suggestion of revolution. But let's not get too hasty. Let's talk about some other options, such as going to a congressperson, arrange a luncheon, and talk about proposing some changes to the Constitution or laws, or vote for them, or vote for a different one. Or you can organize a convention, talk with like-minded people, and sign a petition, or produce media that supports your view, especially now when you can put almost anything on the internet for free. And if they don't listen, protest. Not riot, protest. Like when Gandhi got the UK out of India, or like during the civil rights movement and their march on Washington, D.C. Speaking of the civil rights movement, do what Brown v. Brown v. Board of Education did. Overturn a judicial review, challenge it, and go back to round two. You can try to protest, and it might be the most effective way to change the Constitution, like in the civil rights movement. But even partitions or talking to your congressman or woman are not likely to do anything to change. We can see the best way is to challenge a case, and people can try again with a dissenting opinion. We can see with Plessy v. Ferguson and the ruling reversed in Brown v. Board of Education, or with the Federal Election Act of 1974 being deemed unconstitutional in FEC versus CIS. Citizens United. This is how you can reverse a ruling, showing that the duty of the courts is to deem something uncons unconstitutional because Congress will and does pass things that are unconstitutional, like the Indian Removal Act. Leaving the union is a very real option, and it is a way that we can get our own cons someone can get their own constitution. It has not worked well, but Reconstruction was a disaster. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. Abraham Lincoln. This is a sad foreshadow of Reconstruction. Thank you for your time. Hey, thank you. Um, when when we're hearing when we're in discussions about the judiciary, I often hear the term judicial activism. What is judicial activism? What does that mean to you? And does that in any way differ from judicial review that we've been talking about? I think that judicial review is an idea. I think that judicial activism is more of you doing it. Um, so you can have judicial review. You can, you can, you know, say if a law is unconstitutional or unconstitutional. But I think that judicial activism is the courts actually doing something about it. They're being active in doing it. Um, I would like to add on to my colleague. I think judicial activism is more partisan. And it's, it's a subject that you feel about and that they are definitely going to make a ruling about. And judicial review is just the idea of deeming something unconstitutional or constitutional. Do you think that the Supreme Court justices should be elected by the people? Or do you think the system works as it is? I think we should, they should be elected and not in standard two, four, or even six year increments, but more of a 15 year increments. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't still be bonded to a single political party like how they are today, but they would all also be elected by the people. And they wouldn't run as say, I am a judge of the Republican party or I'm a judge for the Democratic party. No, you would just run as a judge and they'd look through or your background history would be shown to the public. It wouldn't be as such as, oh, I am a Republican judge, vote for me if you're Republican. No, it'd be more of a, uh, I'm a, I'm a judge from New York who's had 30 years of experience and I know what I'm doing kind of thing. I would like to respectfully disagree with my colleague, but uh, we should still, they should, could be elected, but I feel they should still be on for life because if they're on for life, then their opinion is less likely to change and therefore it's harder to pack the courts in uh, one's favor. So it keeps them on for a long time and it stops the judges from being swayed by political parties. And I mean, they're already trying to anyway. I'd like to respectfully disagree with my colleague Ruger and agree with my colleague Ethan, um, because I personally think that a judge cannot be as great for so long. Yes, they may be more experienced in their work, but they are not, I mean, they're just getting too old for it. and. If, the, if there's new people in charge and they have someone in the courts that just is outdated, you could say, it should be the right to try to put someone new in. I, 
All right, so let's continue on with your thoughts. Um, so we were, you mentioned that people because the judges could become outdated and putting new people on an, on the court. Um, do you think that judicial review is essential to protecting the rights of minorities against the will of the majority? I think that it really is because if you think about it, judicial review is the thing that gives the courts their power. If the, if the courts didn't have judicial review, they really couldn't make any decisions. And I think that the simple fact that they have the ability to make decisions already makes the minority have a bit of an upper hand on the majority, but it's also vice versa. They both have an upper hand on each other using that because the minorities then can have something done if the, if the majority is trying to outrule them because the courts have a way to deal with it. Um, I would like to add on to my colleague. Um, I think judicial review is just a lot of check and balances on Congress to limit their power over complete control, you could say, or doing something that's unconstitutional. I would like to add on to my colleague and point to the civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, without judicial review, we, would, we probably would have never seen the changes as fast as we did. It would have taken much longer. And honestly, as some people point out, can equality really wait? Why, why is that? I want to follow up on that. Why would a minority find it better to appeal to the courts than to the other branches of government? I think that if, if, if they appeal to the, if they appeal to the courts, they actually have a, they have a higher chance of getting something done in the courts than any other branches. You can bring something to Congress, but Congress is more of like war and the big decisions of the country and those, and some of those bigger laws. And then, you know, the president, that's the president. They kind of control most of the, most of the federal government, but then you have the courts and they're really what gives every kind of like everybody else, their power it gives almost everybody else the ability to change our nation. I would like to add on to my colleague and the fact that uh, the courts are the one of the most crucial parts of this nation. Without any courts, the laws are meaningless in my mind. Because if there's no one to enforce the laws, why should there be laws in the first place? And the courts are there to enforce the laws, not as police, but as, mm, man, I know this might sound ironic, but judge and jury. And, well, not jury per se, but as judge. And they are the, the leading law, or not the leading law of the land per se, but the leading law bringers of the land. I'd like to go back to the case of Marbury versus Madison, which you uh, nicely discussed in your opening statement. Can you talk a little bit more about how Chief Justice John Marshall justified the establishment of judicial review? Because that was not um, in the constitution per se. I think that they, I think that he ended up ratifying it, right? I'm going to say ratify, but he ended up confirming it and agreeing with it because I think that he saw that our nation could be better with the judicial review and that during that court case, he was seeing the effects that the judicial review could have and therefore he implemented judicial review on that court case and it worked. Okay. Um, I'm going to... oh, oh, no, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. You can go. Please, you can add on to the statement. No worries. Right. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to add on to my colleague. John Marshall was very revolutionary in his ideas of the courts. And honestly, he, he wanted to, because his job didn't have that much power to. And we can see with the establishment of judicial review, he brought a lot more power to the courts, making it almost a staple. When, when we think of like the three branches, we think of the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and the executive. Well, back then, there really wasn't that much of a judicial branch. It really didn't have that much power on it. And I would like to agree with my colleague Blake on how it would really help the nation and regulate it if they had judicial review. All right, so we probably won't get through this question, but I'm just going to ask anyway. Um, we'll talk about the role of judicial review in checks and balances. 
And you're right. We're not. Yep. Going to do so that. there you go. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, again, very, I very much uh, enjoyed our discussion uh, today. Uh, you you ran through uh, some of the important cases, uh, Plessy, Brown, Citizens United. You had the quote from Jefferson. Um, this probably won't seem it like very much to you, uh, but when you when you presented the idea that one way we could deal with this is to secede, um, that, that's been tried and as you pointed out, it didn't work out all that well. But at least you pronounced the term correctly. Uh, there was a Mississippi state legislator who recently uh, said that he thought Mississippi should succeed. Uh, a lot of people agree with that, but I don't think that's what he meant to say. You actually uh, pronounced it correctly. I like the, the, the discussion where you, you didn't just take the legalistic approach, that you talked about protest and the importance of dissenting opinions, um, things of that nature, when you, you said that maybe we uh, you uh, would uh, want to uh, change the way the court is uh, selected because uh, some people get too old. That's exactly the logic that President Roosevelt used for his court packing plan. He didn't come out and say, I want to have six new appointments to the Supreme Court. He said, you know, these we need to help these old people out here. And uh, so if, if we could just give me a new appointment for every justice who's over 70 years of age. Well, you know, that just kind of accidentally gives him uh, six new uh, six new appointments to the Supreme Court or six new nominations. It wasn't going anywhere, uh, but it, it at least planted the idea. Uh, so I, I was particularly impressed with how far ranging the discussion was. It wasn't just focused on the judiciary, but you had an appreciation of how the judiciary fits in with, with the rest of the government. Good job. Yeah, I thought you uh, had a really strong um, opening statement and you did a great job with answering uh, the questions. In addition to the fact that, you know, you knew kind of the basics of um, judicial review and you brought in ca uh, court cases and uh, talked about uh, amendments. I really like the way that you were very thoughtful about, you know, things that people can do to try and, you know, kind of influence policy or influence the court, the idea of uh, having a lunch with your member of Congress and voting and, you know, using media to try and influence uh, positions on things and protesting. I thought that was, you know, really kind of a, a good way of looking at uh, that part of the question. Um, I also, in answer to my question, uh, just like my colleague uh, about um, should uh, the justices be elected, I thought your ideas were really uh, quite interesting. The idea of a 15 year uh, window, but then um, there was respectful disagreement among the team, which I thought was really helpful in seeing a variety of perspectives uh, in terms of that question. So, um, uh, there's just a lot that went on in the conversation that I thought was, you know, really interesting and that, that indicated that you had a, a pretty deep knowledge of um, the issues surrounding uh, judicial review and that you were staking out strong positions on it. And um, I, I thought that was just a, a really great performance today. Yes, I agree with everything my colleague said. Very robust discussion today. We could have continued on for a little bit longer. Um, and I appreciated your how the people could change the Constitution discussion as well, even though, yeah, at the end of the day, they might be better off at the courts, even if the courts don't, might not even hear their case, you know, you never know. But I appreciate that you were able to acknowledge that, that, yeah, it, the process is kind of sticky and it might not get as far as we want it to go, but at least you're trying it and you're looking at different avenues to make sure that occurs. And I appreciate appreciated that a whole lot. Um, I liked your court cases that you brought in. Just outstanding today. Well done. Very well done.